Hey guys and gals, welcome back. Man, after that four part series on the M8, comments coming in like crazy. Uh, I've got a couple of special treats for you today that I wanna tell you about before we start this process on the twin cam teardown. Now, the purpose of the twin cam teardown, it's a completely stock 2007 with around 30,000 miles on it. We're doing a Skunk Works full 107 on it. During this teardown, we're gonna go component by component. I'm gonna show you close up wear patterns and things that you should look for anytime you're tearing down your own engine. So stay tuned. Okay, before we get started on the teardown with the twin cam in the first installment of this multi-part series, you guys commented, and you're gonna get it. First off, you'll notice the camera on my head. Yeah, I'm gonna run an extra camera. You wanted to see what I see. So we'll give it a shot on this video and we'll see what happens. But for now, I'm gonna take this off my head. So the other thing that we've got going on is I was in here this morning uh, working on one assembly for a Skunk Works build for one of our customers and also diving into this Evo. I know we got a lot of owners that have requested Evos. Well. Here's an Evo with a whole bunch of metal bits and pieces in it as well. Have a look at that. So this Evo destructed as well. So after we finish this multi-part series on the twin cam, then we pick back up on the series on the M8 and doing the rebuild, uh, then we'll jump into this Evo and basically do the same thing. You guys seem to like this stuff. So the treat for today, this is Alan. Say, hey, Alan. Hey. Alan is the owner of the M8. Y'all wanted to talk to him and hear kind of what he had to say about his experience. Now, before I jump into that and I let Alan talk, I wanna say something very important. The purpose of those videos was not to bash Harley Davidson. I love the motor company. They build a motorcycle that provides, uh, it provided an industry for and feeds a lot of families. It feeds my family and provides a lot of enjoyment to a lot of people. The video was not in any way to bash Harley Davidson. I do like the motor company. We have to keep in mind, they manufacture 250, 300,000 motorcycles a year. Something is going to happen. It's bound to happen. Nobody's perfect. So it's our job to fix those problems when they come up. So as we move forward, Alan, you own the motorcycle. Bone stock, bought it brand new, 2017, unmodified stock pipe, stock air cleaner, stock everything and the problem started from day one. So tell everybody what you experienced. When I first got it, it had a little valve noise in it. I uh, carried it back to the dealer. The technician said that uh, it wasn't that bad, it just nothing to worry about. So I didn't worry about it, I, I rode it. I uh, changed oil at 500 miles, or 1,000 miles, then I changed it over 5,000 miles since. And I've always checked the uh, magnet on the bottom, no metal. Aluminum won't stick to it, so I didn't know to look for aluminum. Now, there might have been a lot of oil in the first uh, aluminum in the first two or three changes. I don't know. Nobody was looking for it. Didn't know about it until Kevin tore into it and found it. Uh, I went to Sturgis two years ago. Went on out to the coast in California, rode up and down the coast, came back across the, from California, went across the Mojave Desert, 114 degrees on the Mojave Desert, the engine got hot, started to raise and came, I mean really pounding. For a solid week, coming back across the United States, it was raising cane. So when I get back, I took it back to a dealer, but by the time I got down there, it had stopped raising cane, went back to the normal valve pattern. They said they can't find anything wrong. I said, well, it did it for a week and it was very noisy. There's something wrong. Well, it doesn't make any noise now, so it's okay. So they let it go. Well, in that meantime, I met Kevin through a friend of mine who came over here for a tire change on a Kawasaki on. And after talking to Kevin, and I found out he does uh, extended warranty work because I was under warranty when I took it back to the dealer. 
I'm no longer under warranty. I'm under extended warranty. He said he does extended warranty from vehicles. So I told him when I get back from California this time, or from Sturgis, I know that it'll be making noise because it gets hot. So sure enough, it was making noise. I brought it back in. And uh, he heard the noise. And uh, I recorded the noise. I got two or three little recordings of the noise. But he heard it and he said, no, there's something in there. We need to check into it. So that's what happened. He tore into it and you see what he found. I was surprised as anybody to find all that aluminum in there. I wasn't expecting it. Yeah, I wasn't either because the bike, other than running crazy hot on you, I it mean, you, you, the, the mufflers are, were, are gold, the heat shields are gold. Other than it running hot, the bike ran well. It ran well. It was surprisingly good. Yeah. Got fairly decent fuel economy. Right. Right. Man, it's it's quite a thing. Well, I know I know when you well when you dropped it off to, with us the first time, I couldn't duplicate the noise. But then when you took the bike back and you sent me that video, it was like, nope, stop. <laughs> let's get that thing in here and tear it down. Yeah. I mean, when this starts when this starts to make a noise, it sounds like somebody down there with a hammer. Wow. I mean, really badly. And uh, coming back the first time. I almost stopped at a dealer out there and had them check it, but I couldn't afford to stay out there that long because I knew I had to get on back. And I knew if I took it to the shop, I'd be there for a week or two till they fixed it. And I, I didn't I didn't have the time for that. I had to get back. So I, I did it when I got back, and by that time, it quit making noise. And there was nothing wrong with it as far as I was concerned. Yeah. But that was at a dealer. And uh, I'm not at a dealer now. It's hard to get a technician at a dealer to listen to your problems because to them if they can't hear it it's not a problem so they pass it on and that's where i am with a dealer right now yeah well i mean like i like i've said over and over you know I, I operate on the philosophy just like i told alan if you remember when you came in you know your bike better than i do because you're the one that spends all the time on it and people aren't just going to invent issues and invent problems if you hear a noise and something changes it's it's my job to determine what that is and either put your mind at ease or make a repair it's it's one or the other but it shouldn't just be you know that's normal so what we're going to do yes we are splitting the cases fully inspect the crank we're going to go through every aspect of that engine and make sure that everything is as it should be clean proper go back together with it and of course that'll be part five and six of the video series doing the rebuild on the engine so before i get started on the twin cam a big question i have for you what advice would you have for somebody that was in a similar situation as you that had felt that they truly had a problem on their bike and they get frustrated a problem tough to duplicate whatever what advice would you have for somebody like yourself Find you someone that will listen to you that is a good mechanic, and it's hard to find that. They're, they're, I find it, they don't want to listen to me. And I am a little bit mechanically inclined, so I know when I hear noise, most of the time I have an idea where it's coming from. Not always, but most of the time. Thanks, man. You're welcome. I appreciate you very much. I appreciate you fixing my bike. Yeah. No more tacky, 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 right? Oh, hope not. Um, all right, so you'll notice uh, we've got a, a ton of fans from uh, Oz, the land down under, and uh, also New Zealand. I absolutely, I've been to Australia a couple of times. Absolutely love it there. I've got some great friends there. You'll notice APL Performance. If you're in and around that Sydney area, Adam and Julie Layton there at APL Performance. I've uh, been great friends for a long time. Of course, if you live there, you'll know that uh, Adam also races the Gulf Oil uh, top fuel bike, so which is awesome, very cool. And so, man, a lot of friends. If you're in the Brisbane area, uh, Raleigh's, Raleigh's a great friend. You got John, Berto there, good guys. Uh, if you go over to Morgan & Wacker, the dealership there, uh, then uh, Malcolm Martin is over there. So, I mean, there's, man, uh, it's a beautiful country. Loved spending my time there. So thanks to all the viewers from Australia and a little plug for my buddy Adam at APL. So let's hop over to the shop and put the camera on my head and let's start tearing down a twin cam.
All right, here we go. 2007 FLH twin cam, 96 inch motor, completely bone stock. A minute ago, I mentioned 30,000 miles. I actually made a mistake. The bike has 21,000 miles on it. It belongs to Dorothy and Daryl, two of our channel members that live up in North Georgia. And it's going to be a complete case up, crank and everything 107 built to perfection, exactly to fit their riding style. So thanks Dorothy and Daryl for bringing the bike to us. A big part of the uh, Skunk Works program is, is to diagnose what potential issues with the engine along the teardown process. We want to see wear patterns. We want to look at that. So in this video, it's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you piece by piece, part by part, and we're going to look at the individual wear items of what can happen with a bike with only 20,000 miles on it that's been very well cared for. And we're going to go component by component. We're going to go through the primary, we're going to pull the engine, engine case, we're going to take the engine completely apart, split the cases, and go through every single part. Now, you can see we've already started. We had opened up the rocker boxes already, uh, pulled the plugs out, things like that. Now, the reason I did this, I wanted to check the health of the engine. We did a leak down and cylinder pressure test on it before we ever tore it down, and, and we found the leak down to be relatively excessive. He had about 15% leak down in the front cylinder and just around 10% on the rear. So that's 10% is marginal. 15, now we're, we're getting into that accelerated wear phase. Plus, we had a large differential between the front and rear. We're not exactly sure why yet, but uh, we'll find out along the way. Uh, what I've also done on the other side is open up the cam chest. I wanted to inspect the cam plate, the oil pump, and the crank. 07s were notorious for having crank issues. When we get into the primary, I'll discuss that in more detail. But I wanted to at least check the run out on the pinion shaft side to get an idea of where we're at. Unfortunately, this bike had right at about eight thousandths run out on the crank. Uh, marginal? Okay, it would probably survive there for a while, but uh, definitely not ideal if you're going to be building uh, an engine. Now keep in mind, this is not an all-out performance engine. This is for how they ride. That's what the Skunk Works program is all about, custom tailoring the engine just for them. So it's not going to be a major hot rod. It's going to be a really nice small block Chevy. Let's look at it that way. Uh, what I want to do now is we're going to go piece by piece on the parts that I have already taken off the bike. And we're going to analyze each individual one and show you guys some things to look for. So let's head over to the shelf. Start with the parts we've already taken off. Now let's start at the top and work our way down. So let's start with the rocker supports. One of the first things I want to look at is the rocker tip itself. You know, you can go by the rule of thumb here and see if you feel a ridge or an edge or a groove or anything like that. And I don't feel it on this one. So, uh, so far, these rocker arms look pretty good. The other thing I want to look at is inside the pushrod pocket down inside there. I should see a really nice, uh, almost polished ring that's concentric with the oil feed hole underneath. And that's a good indication of push rods are staying relatively tight. I'm also looking to see if there's any sharp edges in there uh, to see if maybe it's, you know, it's mushroomed the tip of the push rod, which we'll inspect the push rod as well to see how everything fits. All of that looks good there. Let's take a look at the rocker arm shafts. One good sign that I'm looking at right away is that these are fairly tight. They're not just coming out. Now, before you disc, before you remove these from a, from the rocker box, if you've already, you know, cut your push rods out, and this is still torqued down in the head, that's an important part of this, torqued down in the head, you want to feel for any axial play in the rocker arm when it's torqued down, okay? I, I like to see somewhere around five to seven thousandths in here, and that can be shimmed with a thrust washer. There's other things you can do is, you know, this, this piece here, this aluminum piece, is actually designed to be sacrificial. So it will rear, wear on the thrust side. So you can shim those up a little bit with a stainless thrust washer. That helps, or you can replace the rocker arm supports if need be uh, to uh, tighten that up. But this can be a source of a lot of noise. 
All right, the other thing, the reason I say it's relatively good that the rocker supports, are, or excuse me, the shafts are tight in here is because it's they're not moving around and dancing around. So the likelihood that we uh, don't have excessive wear on the shafts is actually pretty good, but we're gonna, we're gonna check that anyway. Quick inspection. Okay, we can see a little bit of wear here, not unusual at all. Again, you can't you can't feel it at all, and they were tight in in the bore. So now let's take a look at the bushings. Bushings look uh, the bushings look pretty good in there. Let's give it a trial fit and see. Nice and smooth. A little bit of a burr edge there. We'll probably burr that down. But the bushings inside, they feel good. Not a lot of slop, not a lot of play. I'll save you. That's how you check those. The next thing we can take a look at, let's take a peek at the breathers. Now, these have been upside down and, and draining, so you don't see any oil in here. But we also don't see a lot of particulate and sludge in there. The breathers are actually relatively clean, so that's a, a good thing to check at. Let's take a look at the oil pump. Now we've already pulled the gear rotors out and looked at those. Uh, nice and smooth. There's no excessive wear or sharp edges uh, in, in the gear rotors at all. So that's a good thing. Now let's look inside the pump. Of course, it would be mounted in the engine like this. Now, when we look at it this way, this side looks almost as if it hasn't been touched. There's virtually no wear on this side, but when we flip it over to the other side, we see a, you can see this frosting area, pretty good bit of wear on this side here. Not enough to catch your finger on, but you can tell that the gear rotor on the inside of the pump was basically forced this direction. Now, this is an important point. Remember, we had excessive crank run out here. Uh, so not enough to completely disintegrate the pump, but enough to accelerate the wear on this side. It does have on this side here where the other gear rotor is, it does have a little bit of an edge. Let me rewind on that. Uh, I would probably replace this pump because there is a lip from the inner gear rotors where it's been forced to one side. Now, before we take a look at the cam plate, I'm going to tell you, I would expect on the opposite side of the cam plate to see accelerated wear. And then again, on the opposing side of, of the, uh, the cam plate itself on the bushing, that because again remember that crank is shifting around like that so i would expect to see it where here where here on the cam plate and where here on the bushing in the cam plate all right so that's the oil pump so if we move to the cam plate and that's exactly what we see inside here on the bushing so we've got accelerated wear on that side that side looks virtually untouched when i feel in there there is a pretty sharp edge in the the galley that's in there for the oil flow there's a sharp edge in there, and you can almost see it on the bushing, the uneven wear that's on this side versus this side here. Now, on cam plates, there is a bushing in here. In 2000 to 2011, I believe it was, they removed this bushing, and it's just cam on cam plate. So uh, we used to service these cam plates and replace the bushings, but once they pulled them out, it got to the point it was just, you know, there were so many other issues with cam plates, just replace the cam plate. So we, we quit servicing that. Now let's take a look at the opposite side. The cam's telling us quite a story here, by the way. We'll get to that in just a second. So exactly what I would expect to see on the opposing side, there's accelerated wear here. Now, if I feel this, again, using the fingernail rule of thumb, there isn't a ridge there. We gotta remember this engine has 20,000 miles on it. At 40 to 50,000 miles, this would have been an issue and he would have experienced either a loss of oil pressure or start possibly sumping a little bit but in, in this state that it's in right now that i cannot feel that area uh if it wasn't for the bushing you know and just focus on this area here if it wasn't for the bushing i would probably uh after flushing this out checking it if there were no other issues you could probably reuse this cam plate and not have any not have any problems there now for the cams the cams are going to tell us quite a story he did complain of some noise and some ticking here and there now that ticking could either be a roller on a lifter 
or it could have, you know, or it could have been the plunger. It could have been it's not maintaining oil pressure. It could, you know, various different things. But let's take a look at the cam lobes. You'll notice this gray area that's in the middle. All right, now that's that's expected over time to see some of that. And what that discoloration is 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 the lifter roller essentially wearing through the the hardness layer of the cam. Uh, not an ideal thing. This cam could probably go a little bit longer. Uh, if it wasn't, you know, you know, with just that there, not incredibly unusual. But one thing you can do is run your fingers around the cam lobes like this and feel for any dips. All right, and well, there's one right there, a major one. So let's take a look. Right there, there's a dip in that area right there. Now let's rotate it around. Oh, look right there. See that spot? Well, let's see if I can wipe this off. Right above my fingernail right there, there's a round area right there in, on that cam lobe. Now, what this could be is either a weak valve spring, it could be a weak plunger in the lifter, and something is creating essentially excessive mechanical clearance on that lifter right there. And more than likely what's happening, it's coming over the cam lobe and bouncing and hitting right there. And that could very well be the tick that he's hearing because the rocker supports were tight. The rocker shafts were tight, but he had this tick coming and going. Uh, so in this one, I believe we've got a lifter plunger uh, that's that's more than likely weak and allowing the cam to bounce as it comes over uh, over on the on the lobe there. Uh, plus, as we roll it around, you can see there's a good bit of excessive uneven discoloration here, as if it's only riding on one side of the lifter roller. Now, one, one another aspect we're going to check is lifter to bore clearance, if uh, which is a relatively common problem. If lifter to bore clearance is off, then that lifter would not pressurize as much as you would want it to, and could create slack in the line and and or in the oil supply lines, which would also uh, create a ticking noise. Now, if we look at the front cam, the front cam not as bad, not as bad at all. Uh, I'm virtually. I'd say virtually nowhere on that one. So his tick may very well be isolated to to uh, a, a, a weak lifter creating that divot, cam plate and oil pump. Now you need to take a look at the how to read a spark plug video. We can tell a lot about spark plugs. So the plugs don't look too bad. Uh, they He was experiencing a significant amount of detonation because I can see the brown specks that are in here and he's got pretty good amount of deposits in here. More than likely, these deposits are coming from a little bit of oil blow-by. Uh, we do know that he had uh, had a little bit of a leak down variance there, so that would explain that. But yes, he does have a little bit of a little bit of detonation uh, going on. You can see the, the brown ring there, so check out the How to Read a Spark Plug video, and that'll tell you on that. Uh, as far as the tensioners are concerned, more than likely we'll replace the tensioners, but I always like to feel them and this one it's clean on the inside the plunger isn't stuck that's that's another problem you would want to check out the spring because i've seen these plungers actually get in there and they stick and then they they don't work as well as they should plug wires of course you want to look at plug wires i always like to own them out and uh and make sure they're good i want to you know look in there and the, at the connection see if there's any any type of uh build up or anything in there but uh you know we don't them out look for any breaks things like that before we get uh before we get too deep into it now let's walk over and take a look at the cam chest all right so i've already pulled a couple of lifters out here and so this lifter was rear and front all right and if we look at the rollers we can see quite a difference on the rollers uh, as far as a wear pattern is concerned. Now, we, we had talked about the plunger being weak. That plunger, I cannot compress at all. This plunger, that one's pretty tight as well. I could disassemble the lifter and pump some more oil through it, but regardless, let's take a look at the roller. A little bit of play in the roller there. They're smooth, however, there is quite a bit of slop and going on in the lifter here that could explain the issue with the cam and the dent in the cam and you see this one is not doing that as bad it's actually relatively tight so that could very well be the uh 
his ticking issue is this. And of course, it starts beating the cam up pretty good and then the problems escalate from there. Next, let's take a look at here on the pinion shaft. Now this surface area is important because this has to maintain an oil seal to then pressurize the crank and the rods. So you notice a little hole in there. One thing you wanna do is fill the holes. There should not be a sharp burr or an edge around these holes that are impeding any oil flow. And also, again, the fingernail trick, run that up and down any of the grooves that you see here. As long as you can't feel that groove with your fingernail, then you're okay. Now we're gonna take a look inside the rocker boxes. Uh, I'm gonna obviously, you know, look for any broken springs, look for, you know, any going on in there. And uh, everything looks fine there. Now we can take a look at the throttle body. Again, a lot of this stuff is hints and clues, right? So I'm looking for an excessive amount of oil deposits in here and, uh, you know, potential blow by. I don't have any indication from any of the engine parts, uh, the crank breathers and such, that he had a lot of blow by going on. So I look down in here and I wipe this out and you can see there's not a tremendous amount of, uh, tremendous amount of oil in there. So it's, uh, that's not bad at all. You can feel stickiness in here. If I reach in, do like that, uh, you see how sticky that is. This is uh, thanks to ethanol fuel, to be honest. So it gets in there, it's sticky, it forms a film. The other reason I wanna reach in here and say how much oil is that oil can contaminate uh, things like your intake air temperature sensor and, and also your MAP sensor. So if I had a tremendous amount in here, then you may, bike with this much age, you may want to consider going ahead and replacing those sensors. They're relatively inexpensive. And uh, you know, if you're doing a full build like this, what's a few more bucks, put new sensors in it. The other thing I'm gonna reach in for the port where the idle air control motor is and see if there's a lot of oil buildup that's in there. And you can see there's, there's a good bit in there. This can affect the idle stability if, if this hole is plugged. Uh, of course, what we'll do on this one, we are gonna completely disassemble the throttle body. I'm gonna check the pintle on the end of the idle air control motor and also check the contact surface on the inside of the throttle body. I don't wanna see any uneven wear or anything on that pintle at all. If I did, then I would replace the throttle body and replace the idle air control motor. So hopefully that's an issue. Other things you can look at, you'd be surprised how many of these bikes, this uh, valve cap here, and there's also one on the fly-by-wire throttle bodies back in here, uh, that how many of these fall off and create drivability issues. So always make sure you've got a vacuum cap on that. Interesting thing with throttle position sensors, I actually like to replace throttle position sensors about every 20 to 30,000 miles. Uh, it's essentially just a rheostat in there with windings. And if you think about it, when you ride, you spend 90% of your time between five and 20% throttle. So that being said, those little windings that are in there can wear and create uh, inconsistencies with how the bike idles and, and, and how it runs. So at two, you know 20,000 miles, I'm gonna go ahead and replace this throttle position sensor and it'll be spot on.